summer. What do you guys like to do in the summer? Play with water, grab a dimple. Jesse, what do you like to do with them? Play sports? Do you outside? What do you guys like to do? Um, yeah, that's a favorite of ours, too. At the park. At the park, okay. We play around in the park. Yep, we do lots of that, too. Alice and I have a body. Do you ever do anything as a family outside when it gets to be night? No. You go to bed. Yeah, I like to go to bed too. You like to have fire at Grandma's house. Yeah. At your, oh, your house. Okay, I'm sorry. You guys have campfires? Marshmallows, yeah. Isn't that the best? Yeah. We have campfires, right? We had one, was that just last weekend? At our first one? Two weekends ago? <coughs> yeah. And what do we have, Colson? What do we put together? Yeah. S'mores. You guys like s'mores? Yeah. You do, but Natalie doesn't. No? Well, you can eat them separately if you don't like them. Oh, we make some hot dogs on the fire? That was our plan that night, too, but our wood was a little wet. It's taking a long time to get the fire going, so we just grilled them. <laughs> we'll, do, we'll do hot dogs another night. Well, I brought some things that we need to make s'mores. Okay? And I want you to think about this, and maybe, maybe you'll take time out the next time you have a campfire to have a s'mores prayer. Okay? Because everything that we see outside, everything that we have, we have because God gave it to us, right? The fact that we can cut down a tree and build a fire, right, is, is thanks to God. What? You just have to leave. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to have to go here. We're going to have to talk about this. So to build our s'more, right, we need to have a graham cracker, right? We gotta have the base. So that's the start of our prayers. So, you know, I don't know how you guys start your prayers, but I always say, dear Heavenly Father, we're gonna get to that part, okay? So the base of our our s'more, our first graham cracker, is how we start our prayer. Dear God, thank you, God, Heavenly Father, dear Jesus. Any of those things. Or you, you can come up with your own way to start, but that's our first base, okay? And then I like to put the chocolate on next. And I left it in the wrapper. <laughs> but we put the chocolate on next. And chocolate is what? Is it sour or sweet? Sweet. Yeah, sweet. So, not sour, no. So, when we put our chocolate on, we want to think of all the good, sweet things that are around that God has given us. Alright, so maybe you can go around your campfire and everybody can say something that they're thankful for that God fire, gave them. Fire burned you. Fire burned you. Yeah, you got, you got to keep that from it a little bit. <laughs> Don't do this by yourself. Okay? So, when you put your chocolate on, you're going to say thanks for all of the sweet things that God has given you in your life. All right? And then, what about marshmallows? They get a little what? Gooey, sticky. Okay? Well, guess what? Yeah, though well, you can get those really big ones, huh? I mean, they're sticky. But when you put this over the fire, what happens to it? It goes kind of blows up some, and it gets really ooey-gooey and sticky. Well, life gets a little sticky sometimes. You ever? Well, we're not going to start a fire and make this gooey, okay? Not in church, but... <laughs> Do you ever get in trouble for anything? I know you're all good boys and girls, but I bet my kids get in trouble for things, and they're good kids, so I bet all of you get in trouble now and again. Okay, hey, that's kind of when life gets sticky. When we do something wrong. 
<laughs> yeah, we get yelled at sometimes. So we want to, we want to, um, in our prayer, while we're around the campfire, we're putting our marshmallow on. We want to ask God for forgiveness for the things that we might have done wrong then, okay? Because this is a reminder that life gets sticky, but God loves us, and he will always forgive us for the things that we've said and done wrong, okay? And adults, we have to ask for that too, okay? And then, what do we say when we're all done praying? What do we say? We finish our Lord's Prayer every time, or any time we pray, we say, amen. Yeah, amen. So your last grand cracker there is your amen, okay? So next time you have a campfire, remember this. And think about how you can all pray together. That's a great opportunity, a good family time to do that together. And you can thank God for the things you've been given, and ask for forgiveness for the things that done wrong, okay? All of this in yummy goodness, right? So, this is going to be one of my kids since I want the hand all over. <laughs> all right, well, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer this morning, then we'll get our treat. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing these children to church today. <clears throat> we thank you for the great outdoors that you've given us. We thank you for the delicious foods that you've given us. And Lord, I just pray that uh, these children and their friends get to spend quality time with their family and that, that that includes you at the same time and that maybe they'll make us more and think about praying to you and thanking you for all the goodness that you give us and asking for forgiveness for all the stickiness we might get ourselves into. We thank you for that opportunity. In Jesus' name we pray.
have Gavin Kimmel and Lena Mossthaler. Please come up. Eternal and heavenly God, we know that you are a God of hope, and you've proved your steadfast love throughout the years. Oh Lord, we thank you for all the blessings that come our way. Help us not to take advantage or take for granted that they'll always be there. Today we pray for our generation and also our future generations. Our ideas of a wholesome and safe place to live have been shattered. We see homeless people, hungry people, children living in broken homes, people who are addicted to drugs and alcohol, people who are lost who need the saving power of Jesus Christ. Even as we look around, we see the symbols of our nation and our God are being held in contempt. Our political leaders hide behind their words, not willing to take a stand for what they know is right. So we lift them up to you. Our religious leaders also seem to be losing their grip of what needs to be done as they get caught up with worldly issues instead of heavenly issues. We pray for them. We pray for the children and youth of this world. We know they're the future for us. And we need to make sure that they have those correct seeds planted in their lives, the seeds of Jesus Christ. We thank you for all those who take the initiative to guide, direct, and teach the young people. But above all, we thank you for sending Jesus, the Christ, to save us from ourselves and our sin. When our life unravels and there seems to be nothing to hold on to, in him we have hope that holds our lives together. In Him we have the hope that our lives will be changed for the better, and through Him we have dreams of eternal life. It's in His name now that we ask that you forgive us of all of our sins and our transgressions. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who guides us, who prays for us, and is there to help us when we are desperate. Help us to be open to the leading of the Holy Spirit. And now we set before you on your throne of grace the prayer requests that were mentioned, the public ones, and the ones that were unspoken. Please answer each one in your time and in your way, and help us to be patient for your answers. In everything we ask for, we ask that it be done for your glory, but for our benefit. 
We exalt your name. We exalt Jesus Christ. And we worship, we will worship you alone, for you alone are worthy of our worship. And we pray this prayer in the name of Jesus, our Savior, who taught us all to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Blessing. 
I thank you for the opportunity to stand in front of these good people and be their messenger. May your Holy Spirit engulf me, engulf each person, that we can hear exactly what you're speaking to us through this message. Not what we think we know we're going to hear, but what we are saying directly to us. And Lord, as I deliver this message, help me to remain humble, just as Christ was humble. Because this message is for your glory and nobody else's. I pray this in the name of our Christ. Amen. Well, the first thing we can learn from this uh, passage is God initiates reconciliation because of our sin. Verse 18 says, Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. Now that statement is very important because it does not say God was reconciled to us. It says we have been reconciled to God. Now why does it say it that way? Well, there was a time in the beginning when this world was in perfect harmony. It was a perfect world. God put Adam and Eve in a perfect environment, and they had a perfect relationship with each other and with the Lord. Well, as you know, then sin came along, and the next thing we see is Adam hiding from God. God was not running from Adam. Adam was running from God. Adam was not looking for God. God was looking for Adam. And from that time until now, every person has been born estranged from God and separated from God. Every person has been born a castaway. You see, battle lines were drawn at the Garden of Eden. And wars have been going on ever since between God and people. That's why a person's greatest need today is reconciliation. You know, we hear a lot today about felt needs. But did you know there's a real difference between felt needs and real needs? Felt needs are the symptoms. Real needs are the root problems. And everybody on earth has basic needs. And if these needs are not met, nothing else really matters. First of all, and most important, everybody needs to have a relationship with God. That should come before your spouse, before your children, your grandchildren, your siblings, your parents. You need to have a relationship with God first and foremost. You see, we've all been separated from God, and we need to have reconciliation. And there's a barrier to that reconciliation. It's called sin. And that is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, that not imputing their trespasses to him. That was verse 19. This is the root problem that Christianity addresses. Not the ignorance of people, though certainly people without Christ are ignorant. Not the meaninglessness of life, the life without Christ is certainly meaningless, but it is the guilt of the sin of the human race that's the primary barrier between God and people. Every person needs their sin to be forgiven and canceled. We need justification. But the good news is this, when our sin is removed and our relationship with God is restored, then we receive eternal life, and that, my friends, is regeneration. Well, how does all this take place? Verse 18 says, Now all things are of God. You see, God initiates this only because He can. You may wake up one day, realize you're st stranded on an island of sin, but at the moment you did, do realize that, you know that only God can take care of that. That's why it's important for you to understand that we do not need religion. You see, religion is man's effort to reconcile God to people. We need a relationship with God, not a religion. The only problem is people need to be reconciled to God, and that's something only God can do. We cannot do that. God has to do that. That's why missions and evangelism are all about telling others not what they can do for God, but telling others what God has already done for them. Second thing we can learn is God facilitates reconciliation through His Son, Jesus. Verse 18 tells us that God has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. Verse 19, it says this, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Verse 20 says, therefore we are ambassadors for Christ. Through Christ, in Christ, for Christ, it all comes back to Christ. How does that take place? Well, verse 21 clears that up pretty good. It says, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, so we might become the righteousness of Him in God. 
You see, reconciliation is what God brought about at the cross in Calvary. The cross is that bridge of reconciliation. Stop for a moment and picture in your mind two cliffs. These cliffs are separated by a large river. The river is filled with crocodiles, piranha, and poisonous snakes. The river is too broad, the current is too swift, the water is too deep, and the stream is just too dangerous to swim. Now suppose you're standing on one cliff, or on the other cliff is a person that you love most in this life, and you want to get to that other person. The problem is there's no human way of crossing that river. The only solution is a bridge. Well, picture again two cliffs. One cliff is sinful mankind. The other cliff is the holy God. And there's a great chasm between man and God. It's called the river of sin. Now, when Jesus died for our sins, he took our sin, he gave us his righteousness, and the moment we accept him as our Lord and Savior, the cross becomes that bridge, enables us to walk over that gulf of sin so we can have a relationship with God. You know, I've read enough over the years to know that biographies all follow the same basic patterns. There's a short section devoted to the birth of this subject. There's a little bit longer section devoted to the youth of the subject, a long section devoted to the adult life of the subject, and a very short section devoted to the death of the subject. Well, as you all well know, there are four biographies of Jesus Christ, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But each one of these biographies is very unique. Two of the four biographies don't even mention the birth of Jesus. Only one of the biographies barely refers to his youth. All four biographies have a lot to say about his adult life, but here's the amazing thing, friends. One-fifth of the Gospel of Matthew is devoted to the death of Jesus. One-third of the Gospel of Mark is devoted to the death of Jesus. Two-fifths of the Gospel of Luke is devoted to the death of Jesus. And fully one-half of the Gospel of John relates somehow or some way to the death of Jesus Christ. Now why, in all the Gospels, is there such a devotion and emphasis on the death of Jesus Christ? I'll tell you why. It's because through his death, we have reconciliation. It's only through his death we have justification. It's only through his death we have regeneration. Verse 21 tells us thoroughly what happened at the cross of Calvary. At the moment Jesus died, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. That is, he took our place. He died on my behalf. He died on your behalf. So we could become the righteousness of God in him. Now let me add just one more word to these other words we've been thinking about. And that word is identification. When God's son came in the form of a man so he could die a human death on behalf of our sin, he made possible our reconciliation. Let me give you an example to maybe clear it up a little bit. I heard about a boat that was plowing through the ocean one time, and on this boat was a boy and his dog. Well, the dog got careless, fell overboard. So the boy became frantic and runs to the captain of the ship and says, Sir, my little dog has fallen overboard. Will you stop the ship so I can rescue him? Well, the captain indignantly said, Son, this ship does not stop for a dog. The little boy said, Well, sir, would you stop this ship to save a boat, boy? The captain said, well, yes, of course we would. Immediately, the boy jumped overboard, swam to the dog, rescued the dog, and then, of course, the captain stopped the boat and rescued them both. Now, just as that boy took the part of that animal, in like fashion, the Lord Jesus Christ did not stand on the sidelines, did not give us advice, did not cheer us on. He identified himself with us. He became sin for us. He took our part, lifted us up off the island of sin by his love. And because of that, we have reconciliation with God. And the third thing we want to learn from this, God de delegates reconciliation to his saints. Three times in this passage, Paul talks about the fact that we've been given the responsibility of reconciling others to God. Verse 18, we're told that God has given us the ministry of reconciliation. In verse 19, we're told God has committed to us 
the word of reconciliation. And in verse 20, we are told we are ambassadors for Christ. And so God is pleading through us. Now, if you think about that carefully, you'll realize exactly what God has done. First of all, we've all been given the ministry of reconciliation, each and every one of us. Listen again to verse 18. God has given us a ministry of reconciliation. Now, reconciliation, as you know, is when you try to bring two parties together who have been estranged, and you try to restore that relationship. Well, God has given us the privilege of taking the hand of the sinner who is willing and the hand of the Savior who is able so the Savior can turn that sinner into a saint. He can turn a criminal into a king. He can turn a slave into a sovereign. And by the way, did you know we're all ministers in one sense? I hear people talking all the time about being called in a full-time Christian ministry. Well, let me tell you something. We've all been given a full-time ministry of reconciliation. Every one of us is a minister of reconciliation. Every one of us has been given a responsibility of taking a person or taking the hand of a person who is lost and through the cross of Calvary, bring the hand of the God to that person and join us in to get hands together so they can be reconciled to God. But we've also been given the message of reconciliation. Verse 19 says that God has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now we know that our ministry is to share a message. And if you are not telling people that they are at war with God, they need to be reconciled with God, they can be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ, then, my friends, you are not fulfilling your ministry that God is requiring of you. Verse 20 says, Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf to be reconciled to God. Now, in Paul's day, the Roman Empire are two different kinds of provinces. One related to the Roman government in a different way. Senatorial provinces were made up of people submitted to Rome and were peacefully living with each other and obeying the law. But imperial provinces were still rebellious and somewhat in a state of war. So Rome sent ambassadors to these provinces to keep the peace and to represent the Roman government. <clears throat> the good news for the human race is this. God has not declared war on the human race. He's declared peace. God's not looking for a truce, nor he's looking for a ceasefire. He's looking for a permanent peace and an eternal relationship with us. You see, God's not interested in rehabilitation of criminals. He's interested in re reconciliation with enemies. And we, you and I, are to be his ambassadors of peace seeking castaways and telling them that because of the cross of Jesus Christ, you can be rescued from the island of sin and be reconciled to God. <clears throat> Let me close with this story. At Stanford University, there's a golden spike. That spike's about six inches long, it weighs 18 ounces, and in 1869, it was valued roughly at $350. But that spike represents what engineers to this day called perhaps the greatest engineering accomplishment in the history of the world. Well, Stephen Ambrose wrote about the, this engineering feat in a great book entitled Nothing Like It in the World. If you like good history, you ought to buy this book and read it. It's a story of building the Transcontinental Railroad. Well, May 8, 1869, on board a special train of the Central Pacific Railroad, traveled a man named Leland Stanford. Stanford University is named after this man. On board that train with Stanford was the last spike that would be driven. The spike was made of gold. The last tie was made out of laurel. And there was a silver-headed hammer, which would be used to complete officially the Transcontinental Railroad. Oh, the ceremony of the completing of the railroad had been elaborately planned. There was a telegraph wire that was to be attached to the golden spike, and another telegraph wire attached to the hammer. When the gold spike was tapped in, the telegraph lines would send a message all around the country and know that the railroad had been completed. <clears throat> well, two men laid down that last tie, that laurel tie. Then Leland Stanford stepped up with that silver headed hammer to tap in that gold spike into the ground, while the entire country waited breathlessly to know the deed had been done. 
Even though Stanford swung and missed, striking on the rail, it still made no difference. The telegraph operator closed the circuit, and the wire went out with one word, and that word was done. It was done. Well, across the nation, bells rang. Even the age Liberty Bell was rang in Philadelphia. Cannons boomed all over America from San Francisco to Washington, D.C. As a matter of fact, it was said that more cannons were fired that day in that celebration than ever took place in the Battle of Gettysburg. Fire whistles, firecrackers, fireworks were going off everywhere. There was singing, there was praying in churches. They say the tabernacle in Salt Lake City, there were 7,000 people in attendance to celebrate this event. Chicago had a parade, they said, was seven miles long with ten thousands or tens of thousands of people participating. Why all this excitement over the completion of a railroad? Well, think about this. Before the Mexican War, during the gold rush that started in 1848 through the 1850s, and until the Civil War ended in 1865, it took a person months and would cost more than a thousand dollars to go from New York to San Francisco. But less than a week after pounding of the Golden Spike, a man or woman could go from New York to San Francisco in seven days for $65. But the change was even greater than that. Mail at once cost dollars per ounce and took forever to go from one end of the country to the other. Now it costs pennies and could go from Chicago to California in just a few days. But even more importantly, the Transcontinental Railroad and the Telegraph together made modern America possible. Things that could not be imagined before 1869 now become commonplace. A nationwide stock market came into existence. So also a continent-wide economy in which people, agricultural products, coal and minerals moved wherever anybody wanted to send them, and they did so cheaply and quickly. A continent wide culture in which mail and popular magazines and books that used to cost dollars per ounce and took forever to go from East Coast to West Coast now it cost pennies and got there in a few days. In other words, America was radically changed and the industrial age had come full bloom. Friends, let me take you back some 2,000 years ago. There was a place called Calvary. The golden spike of God's love was driven through the wrists and the feet of Jesus Christ by that silver-headed hammer of God's grace. And more than the continent was joined together, God and people were reconciled. And I'm here to tell you today that until Jesus comes back, that's our ministry, that's our message, and that's our mission. Saying to the lost world, be reconciled to God, knowing that because of Jesus Christ, you can be. Amen. Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for this wonderful gift of reconciliation. That through Jesus Christ and his atoning death, we are reconciled with you and we become your righteousness. But we also know there's still a lot of work to do. We all know folks, maybe in our own family, that do not know you as Lord and Savior, that they need that reconciliation to come back to you or to come to you. So my charge is to these folks in this prayer, they can seek out these folks that they know that need the saving grace of Jesus Christ and be reconciled and come together and have that right relationship with you. And most importantly, eternal life with you. I pray this in the name of Christ.